My grandfather, Sardar Munsha Singh, was an amazing man. Born in the first decade of the 20th century in undivided Punjab, in the foothill of Himalayas, he only knew Punjabi, which was his mother tongue, as the only language that he knew. And he could only read the language of his scriptures, Gurmukhi. Munshan Singh lost his mother before he could barely remember her face. He lost his older sibling, his only older sibling, when he was a teenager, and his father soon after. He was poisoned once and survived. He lived through two world wars, a bloody partition of Punjab, which ended up losing about more than half a million people, and three Indo-Pakistan and Sino-Indian wars. And yet, any time someone would ask him how he was doing, his response was always, Chardi Kala. He lived a simple, yet very healthy life, and lived up to age of 95. Chardi Kala is a Punjabi word with not, no exact English translation. Eternal optimism comes close, but does not represent what it means. And that is the mystery and power of ethnic languages. They can carry encoded in them simple words that can completely reflect the ethos of life, that can change the outlook of entire communities. All languages carry in them, encoded in them, wisdom distilled over thousands of years. And yet, over the past couple of centuries, we have lost hundreds of these languages. According to the Language Conservancy, about 61% of all languages that were spoken as the first language in 1795 are either doomed or extinct. Now the question is, how can we as technologists and AI researchers ensure that the wisdom of these words remain as we train machines to interact with us? How can we ensure that the ethnic languages, which are usually low resource languages, have appropriate representation in the future that we are building with artificial intelligence? How can we ensure that the future is not product of a single monolingual lingua franca and its customs and beliefs? Such a world would frankly be boring. But the world looks like, and the future looks like, a kaleidoscope of ancient wisdoms. The digital computers reduced all communication to ones and zeros. Ones and zeros are called binary digits, often referred to as bits. A bit can have only two representations, one and zero. Now this may seem very familiar to an older form of primitive communication, smoke signals. Fire on top of a mountain meant enemy attack, Lack of fire, all is well. Fire can be expressed as one. Lack of fire as zero. Although we have our, our modern communication encompasses a lot more complex forms of communication, the basis on which it pivots remains the same. We continue to tell each other, yes, or no, this or that, one or zero. When you press a key on your keyboard, it generates an electric signal, usually digitized as a series of ones and zeros. What does, what does each of this key mean? A key map called American Standard Code for Information Interchange was developed in 1963. 
key that represented 65 would mean an A, 66 would mean a B, and so on. So the Indians developed their own, called it Sky. And so did Japan, and the Arabic world, and the Chinese. Everyone competed for the same keys on one keyboard. Text written in one language would look like garbled on another. And then a beautiful thing happened. The world chose collaboration over competition, and Unicode came along. One giant key table where any key could be represented from any language. 161 scripts and counting. Now an American could write an email with Chinese words in them, and a Punjabi could publish on the web without specifically having to ask its users to download a particular font. This was also the time when open source enthusiasts were advocating for collaborative and open building of high quality software over traditional closed development models. Open source is a movement that advocates for things, which are often software, to be designed for distribution, for modification, for people to be used for their own purposes as they see fit. This is akin to building a bazaar versus building an architecting a cathedral. Linux operating system and Mozilla Firefox and thousands of other softwares open up their code for ethnic communities to change for their own needs. Hobbyist students and language enthusiasts started modifying these open source softwares and their interfaces in their own languages. Again, the world chose collaboration. Common Locale Data Repository became a translation bank in which organizations and individuals alike contributed to translation of software interfaces, which anyone could download and use it for their own purposes. In 2004, a group of volunteers created an operating system in Punjabi. It was a Linux operating system and named it Pun Linux. Today, my Mozilla Firefox browser is available in more than 90 languages. This is the power of an open and collaborative world. Artificial intelligence is a stream of computer science, which has been around since 1960s. It is about training the computer algorithms to do tasks that typically require human intelligence. Machine learning, which is a form of artificial intelligence methods or algorithms, allow computers to learn from patterns within the data without explicitly training them how to do it. However, it was the neural networks, a special form of machine learning algorithms, that simulated the way a human mind thinks that ushered a new era of artificial intelligence in the beginning of this century. Natural language processing, or often called NLP, is a subset of artificial intelligence, linguistics, and computer science, which concerns with interaction between computers and human languages. Voice applications like Siri, poll predictions using social media sentiments, live translation of audio, and recently widely debated ChatGPT are all the products of advancements in natural language processing. However, when it comes to ethnic languages, the research lags far behind. For any language to participate in natural language processing requires a lot of resources. 
Large amounts of text or training corpus forms the basic building block. Text processing tools like stemmers and tokenizers, which convert the text into basic structural elements, form the second layer. Finally, human linguists and machine learning algorithms that train on this text data uh, form the basis on top of which AI algorithms or applications can be built. Now, each of the, these basic structures can vary for all different languages in order to preserve their structural and grammatical nuances. In the beginning of my research, Punjabi, despite being the world's 10th most spoken language, we could not find any open source corpus that we could find suitable for our own research. So we started building our own corpus, which was multi-era, multi-year, multi-source, written by multiple authors. Languages are never stationary, so our next goal was to build a dictionary or a mint which would not only track the older or ancient words, but would also track loan words or the words borrowed from other languages as they are adopted in this globalized world. On top of this data, natural language tools will be built, algorithms trained, and data open sourced. Our goal is to build a model in Punjabi that can be replicated for any other low resource ethnic language for that language to be preserved, revived, and participate in this artificial intelligence revolution. One of the fondest memories that I have from my childhood is sowing wheat along with my grandfather. In the freshly tilled soil burrows, we would drop wheat kernels and a flock of birds would follow, feasting on the seed buffet before they were again buried with soil. Many of the progressive farmers, whose sole measurement of success was the yield of the feed, or the yield of the field, would pre-treat the, the seeds with pesticides in order to avoid the, the, the birds from picking up the seeds. My grandfather's solution, however, was to double the amount of seeds we dropped. His belief was denying the birds their share you know, of seeds or wheat kernels being dropped went against his ethos of Sarbaddapala, which loosely translates to, may everyone prosper. His translation of Sarbat, or all, included the man and the beast, the saint and the sinner, the trees and the environment, everyone and everything included. Sarbaddapala. We are at a crucial juncture of time. Problems like global warming, lack of social cohesion, economic disparity, terrorism, rogue states, and risk of unfettered artificial intelligence threaten our societies like never before. Yet we continue to seek solutions for these problems in academic knowledge developed in a very narrow worldview in a very narrow slice of time. What if the solution to these world problems lies in a language that died yesterday? Thank you. <laughs>